said, we'll be talking about building binary extensions. This is sort of a, a combined update over PyBind 11, um, scikit build and CI build wheel, not actually in that order, uh, and then a couple of other things as well. So first we'll uh, talk a little bit about PyBind 11. If you don't, if you haven't heard of that or haven't used that, it's a header only pure C++ um, interface to CPython and PyPy using the CPython um, API. Uh, this first phrase there, header only, means it's really uh, trivial to add to a project. You don't have some sort of special build um, process. You know, this, and it's just straight C++. You're not writing a different language. You're not running a preprocessor. You're just using um, a C++ uh, templated C++ header only library. And it's really designed for one very specific purpose, and that is to bind um, existing C++ and um, and Python. And it really it works both directions, but it's primarily for the um, direction of of creating extension modules. So you can kind of think of it like a C++ API for Python. Here's a quick little example of usage. Um, here's uh, just a little function. This is just your, your um, C++. And then you can create a, a module. And then you can just add this, this function. Tell, you tell it what name you want to attach it to. You have full control over exactly how it's presented in the Python side. But you're not repeating yourself over and over or re-exporting headers or something like that. Okay, and then it can even infer signatures and do a few things like that for you. And you could actually even run this if you want. If you're running Linux, this is the Linux command line. The Mac one is slightly different. So it really has a lot of different features. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of them, but just to point out a few of these things. Um, it's being used in lots of different areas. It's used in SciPy. It's used in PyTorch. It's used. It's used lots of, of in lots of places. Google's using it uh, fairly heavily and, and moving to use it even more. And uh, it really just has a variety of things that just make it a very, uh, very nice thing, uh, thing to use. Okay, so uh, I gave a, a talk on PyBind 11 on last the maintainer's track last year. Feel free to look back at that if you want to find about, out about things that were happening before that. Uh, 2.7 was actually released on the, the same day as last uh, the last SciPy talk, uh, and then so since then we've had three. Um, two or three releases. Uh, here we see a few of the new features that have come out um, in 2.8. Uh, we really started doing a lot more with chaining exceptions together using the Python 3 chaining um, uh, exceptions. There's a way to do it manually. And then over the next few releases, we keep we kept adding more and more um, automatic chaining for things that it, where it would know the, the uh, what exception caused what exception. Um, you'll see uh, things like um, extra access to arrays, there's uh, actually a very, very old bug, so you can now do custom new support. There's uh, a variety of different uh, different things here. There's, and this is just sort of the, the tip of the iceberg. There's all sorts of fixes and, and things in the, behind that as well. And then in 2.9, we actually added the support for putting pyargs wherever you want. So it works just like Python now, where you can put pyargs, collect all of the arguments, and then things after that are keyword only. Um, the uh, we did a major rename here. So if you're using the un single underscore, that's not a very good name for things. So we'd rename that to const name. Um, and uh, the old one is still available unless you're defining this as a macro, like if you're using git text. And uh, we have you know, a variety of, so variety of other things. There's really a lot of, again, there's a lot of things behind the scenes that's going on here. So this, there are um, you know, roughly 100 PRs or more for each of these releases. And then 2.10, uh, this is where we are finally removing Python 2.7 and 3.5. Uh, this has been, uh, this happened a while back in our um, master branch, but uh, it's actually, this, this release is actually uh, happening today. This is also where we're getting rid of MSVC 2015. That was another nice thing to get out of there. There's not really much point to have that once you've gotten rid of 3.5 and 2, um, well, 3.5, 2.7 wasn't even that. And, um, this also is the first one where we fully support the Python 3.11 betas. So if you're interested in playing with the, the betas and you're using PyBind 11, uh, we should fully support them uh, as of this release. And then there's a variety of other things that are that are happening there, more um, features for sets. As soon as the release is finished, it was I actually started the process, but it uh, should finish a little bit, you know, another hour or two. Uh, you should actually be able to see our new docs theme um, which is based on Furo. So I think hopefully you'll, you'll like that. It look, looks prettier. 
and supports dark mode and stuff. Okay. So uh, again, a lot of different things are um, happening there. And we are also um, working a bit on supporting uh, WebAssembly a bit better. Um, we already we do have uh, obviously SciPy is in WebAssembly. I've released Boost Histogram, which is a PyBind 11 extension in WebAssembly. So we've we've uh, um, been working with the PyDi team as well. Okay. Now there are some um, upcoming plans. This slide is actually if you uh, I recommend you don't go back and look at my old talk and look at this uh, the slide in my old talk because um, you'll actually see. Uh, this really hasn't uh, changed. I, I just removed the drop Python 2.7, 3.5. I think as you've seen, a lot of things have been happening. Uh, these are just very major projects that are still ongoing. Uh, I think this is this is the optional precompilation is is sort of ramping up, and that will that should happen soon. But um, it's just it changes so much of the code, and we have so much other stuff going on. It's really really hard to just say, all right, we're going to change every single file, move everything around. You know, all 100. PRs that are in progress need to just be invalid now. But uh, we are working on that. And then um, the smart holder branch is, is in very heavy use if you do want to use it, but it's still being maintained separately by Google. Um, we are working on a few other things um, like better second build integration, which I'll mention um, before. And there's something new along that has come along, um, but actually is not on the next slide anymore because I stuck something in between. Uh, I do want to just point out something since this is a maintainer's track. One of the things that we do that's kind of kind of an interesting um, system. We have a release note system, uh, and what happens is on every pull request you get this template uh, to fill out. And the important part of this template, which has this giant warning here saying "Please don't delete this," uh, is this suggested change log entry. And currently, that's in restructured text. Uh, I would like to move it to Markdown at some point because everybody writes Markdown in this block anyway. Um, but you fill in your uh, change log entry right here. Okay, then once your pull request gets merged, uh, a, a GitHub bot goes out and it marks that um, uh, that thing that you um, that pull request with a tag saying needs release notes or needs or uh, needs to be added to the release notes. And then we have a, a little script. I won't show you the script. It's easy to find in PyBind 11, but this is the Nox runner for it. Um, and that little script goes through it pulls the GitHub API, it grabs all of the things that have been tagged, that have been merged, and uh, then spits out something that, that looks like this. And Nox is really nice because we don't have to worry about setting up an environment, so things that does that, all that for you. So Nox is just a, a really great tool for random developer tasks too. And uh, this is the output um, from, I think, yesterday. So you run it, it goes through, it spits out what it what it read. You'll see somebody left a blank. They forgot to enter something. So you can just click on this, this link, jump over to that, that pull request, edit, edit it, remove the label if it doesn't make sense. And then once everything is nice, you'll see these people. You know, I told you everybody puts markdown anyway, even if you say restructured text. So you this, but it's in nice red color here, so you can go and, and fix that. Um, and it tells you if anybody deleted that. And those are the pull requests that have a tag, but not, but no uh, no release notes. And uh, it even gives you the little template that you can copy and paste back in because that's probably what you need to, to add to this thing because they deleted it. So um, this is a fairly nice way to do uh, to handle release notes when you have lots of different pull requests going in at the same time and you don't have to have um, sort of separate files or something. It's all integrated into the GitHub pull request. I thought that was something to, to point out. Not saying it's better than any other system, but it's an interesting system. Uh, so this is the other thing that's come along, and this is NanoBind. It's a new package from the author of PyBind 11, um, and it has higher requirements than PyBind 11. It was designed around um, Python 3.8's vector call and uh, requires C++ 17, uses that pretty heavily. Uh, very similar API. It's meant to be pretty much a, a drop-in replacement, but much more limited, something that's just focused. Uh, PyBind 11 sort of tries to adapt to whatever you're, uh, whatever you're doing, whereas NanoBind, you need to adapt to NanoBind. Uh, uh, because that we can, it can really focus on small, efficient bindings. So if the binding compile time or binding uh, file size is important for if you have, let's say, a really small project and this is something that really matters to you, if you're doing a large project and this is like 5% of your total compile time and 5% of your total um, size, then obviously it doesn't, uh, there's not as much benefit. Um, but uh, this does much better in, in sort of those three key areas, runtime performance, binary size, and compilation time. 
And some of these ideas are can be and are being backported to PyBind 11 as well. So definitely something to, to check out. Uh, just to briefly mention Build, since I'm part of that uh, project as well, Build is a tool that builds uh, wheels and SDISTs. Um, it's an ideal tool if you're building a pure Python wheel. It also builds binary wheels, but there's a bunch of other things you have to, to take into account if you're doing binary wheels about um, making them redistributable. Um, and that has had a few features uh, added as well. This is a little example of what it requires in GitHub Actions to do build. You've got just this line, pipx run build. Pip pipx is a uh, supported platform on GitHub Actions, supported package manager. So you can just say pipx run build, and that will build a wheel and an SDIST for you. Um, I would recommend uploading them and then, then having a separate little step that downloads them and submits them to PyPy if that's what you want. Okay. Um, and uh, there's some uh, some things planned planned there. We've already had better printout error messages, Python 3.11 support, but we're adding a few things uh, in the in the future as well, including improving the bootstrapping um, situation. This is a very core package to Python. Uh, also, so next I want to go over CI Build Wheel. This is a um, multi-platform uh, redistributable wheel builder. So this is for generally for binary wheels that you're creating and that need to be dis uh, distributed to an audience. And this supports all the major CI providers. It's a pure it's a pure Python package itself. So it's able to have um, to sort of be designed around um, best practices and, and for Python packages. Uh, so it supports all the things you see over over here. Um, I also covered this a little bit in my talk last year. You can look, look there to see what was happening. Um, 2.0 was actually released uh, the same day as that last talk as well. And uh, this is what it looks like. You'll see it's really not that much that not uh, not that much more. It has its own built-in action. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And uh, you just need to build it on the, uh, the various different platforms. But that, that's about all, all you need to do. Uh, it's actually just a, a Python package. So you could say pipx run CI build, build wheel here. In fact, that's pretty much what that action is actually literally doing. Um, just to briefly mention mini Linux, if you're not familiar with building, these are the different flavors of mini Linux. I need to uh, give you a few uh, quick uh, announcements on this. Mini Linux one, of course, you should hopefully not be using. Um, it uh, support ended, but it is, is still being updated and it will until the CI breaks. Um, the main reason to use Mini Linux One is not because you're running on a system older than than um, the Red Hat Six. The main reason is because Pip uh, Nine requires Mini Linux One. It doesn't. It does not know how to understand these other other things. So please upgrade your pips and try not to use System Pip if you're on a old system like that. Uh, Mini Linux Twenty Ten is actually going to uh, has support ending and is being removed August first. And Mini Linux 224 was an experiment in, in Debian that, that didn't uh, work out very well, so that's likely to end as well. So really the default and the best thing to be using today is 2014. And then the uh, 228 is really the next, the SQL image. It's based on the same sort of family. Um, and it's uh, the, one of the problems here is you're stuck with really old compilers because you don't have the uh, Red Hat um, developer kit, which has the, the nice tricks of statically linking to the things that are newer than the operating system provides. Okay, and uh, Musil Linux is also the sort of special thing down here. So what's new since since last um, SciPy? Well, uh, sort of this broke it up into two halves. Um, which technically this is PyCon in the middle, which is why it's broken into halves. Uh, this, here we have um, better support for local runs. So you can run CI build wheel locally. Um, and uh, it's it's a little bit nicer about not trying to install things to global locations and things. Um, there's a really nice override mechanism that was added to the uh, static configuration support. Of course, that default I just mentioned of 2014, Musil Linux was added, um, and so a few other features that had been requested. And then in the most recent, uh, roughly couple of months or so, uh, we've also added support for building and testing ABI3 wheels, uh, pure Pythonless wheels. Uh, also, um, you can build directly from an S-Disk now. Um, we support Python 3.11, in fact. Uh, so in, in development, these the uh, new setup Python environment, which I'll mention in a second, as well as the uh, 11 before, those should come out, I think, later today uh, or tomorrow, something in that range. And then that right after that, 3.6 will be removed as a host runner. It's still supported as a target. Okay. Um, and this, I actually had no idea this didn't work. So I may have told you that this worked before. Well, now I believe it actually does work. You can you can make a Linux wheel from Windows now. 
um, you have to make, Pathlib really helps with that. Okay, uh, and then there's some other ideas that are coming along. Cross-compiling is really a, a big uh, big interest. Um, it's, if you're interested, you can find the, the pull requests for these or the discussions. So uh, let me know if you know, know something about this and can help. Um, and we have some ideas for making the local run a little bit easier. If you wanna run it locally, that's really the best way to do it. You just need to tell it what platform you're targeting. It doesn't have to be the platform you're on. Um, at least you can always target Linux from, from any platform now. And then um, you know you just you just run this. I highly recommend using the uh, static configuration, the pyproject.toml configuration rather than environment variables because that really helps you run locally. That allows you to switch between CIs without changing things. Uh, and it's you don't have to stick a bunch of stuff in your, your um, CI scripts. Um, also, if you're using, I highly recommend using Dependabot. So you actually, as you noticed before, I put the exact tagged version of, of CI build wheel, and then you can use a GitHub action. Now, this is what I used to recommend. Um, I actually don't, I actually don't recommend putting this anymore because you don't need to. Um, Dependabot actually will, if you put a V1, so check out V1 or something, it will try to upgrade it to V2 rather than uh, sticking a fully tagged version and then spamming you with updates on something you don't care about. Um, so now you can just write this and that can be your Dependabot. Uh, and this is a great way to keep up your actions, especially CI build wheel. Uh, this CI build wheel itself has a composite action. I think this is a really useful um, skill to have in your tool set. So uh, this is how you could write one. So you would, if, and this was actually merged into um, set up Python in v4.1.0, um, which released about a week ago. Um, so what you can do is you can now put an ID here, uh, and then you can say update environment false. And this, this setup Python will not update your, uh, the environment. It will not add Python to your environment, but it will provide a steps.python.outputs.python path. And you can pass that to pipx. So now this pipx is running 3.10, 3.7 to 3.10. Um, because you gave such a big range, it will grab, it'll probably be able to get something from the system and won't even take time to download anything. And, uh, it'll usually be 3.10. And now your action is using Python 3.10, but it's not uh, it's not leaking anything into the environment. So the person who uses it doesn't have to worry that they now have you know, their Python version changed or something like that. So this is a self-contained composite action. This is everything everything you uh, need. Feel free to look at the ones in Knox and CI Build Wheel. Um, that's been merged, I believe, in both both packages now. The use of this this technique. So this is very, very nice. And if you have a package you wanna run that's not your local package, you can just stick it there. This is how you run a local package. Okay. Um, so now I'm gonna move on to scikit build. Uh, this is a CMake build, uh, based build backend for Python. This was developed and uh, was actually announced in 2014 and again in 2016 uh, SciPies. And uh, this, uh, is also a sort of organization that includes CMake for Python and Ninja for Python. So if you ever said pip install Ninja or CMake, that's just, you get it from, from here. Uh, and these things we really, uh, we added, we moved everything over to CI build wheel. So that gave us the ability to target all the different ar architectures and um, Musa Linux and Apple Silicon and all, whatever, whatever else is uh, out there. Um, and uh, this, this is, so this has been around for uh, like eight, eight years or something like that now, but, um, Currently it's designed as a setup tools wrapper and it uses distutils quite heavily, which is a bit of a problem if you've heard distutils is going away. So um, now this the, the situation is actually much nicer if you're doing a pure Python package. If you write a pure Python package, this is all you need nowadays. This is actually a, a complete Python um, project description. Uh, this is using uh, Hatchling, which is a really nice, nice tool to use for this. And um, then this is all you need. You can, you can put a bit more, and I, I would recommend putting a bit more. Uh, go to scikit-hep.org.developer or packaging.python.org. Um, I wrote both of those, uh, the support for this sort of configuration for both of those. Um, but, and you can get a little bit more detail about some of the other good things to add. But this is limited to pure, mostly to pure Python at the moment. It would be really nice if you could actually do compile extensions this way. So if you look at a, a timeline, you'll see that scikit build was introduced here in 2014. And uh, around 2015, we had the addition of PEP 517 and 518, which really changed the game for um, 
using something other than setup tools and disk utils. And uh, since then, we've had a variety of other ways that are other PEPs that have, have come out that have defined um, very important missing, missing pieces, like just doing a standard configuration format, editable installs. And of course, we are removing uh, the Python, the uh, disk utils from the standard library here. Now, this, uh, there's a proposed project to um, work on scikit build, and I'll be, I'll be working on that uh, over the next three years. So this is the way it sort of, it, uh, things work today. This is a, just a straight um, minus the CMake list, but this is sort of what you would do uh, with disk utils and setup tools. Uh, and there's a variety of issues with doing this. Um, NumPy.distutils, which is going away, is actually over 13,000 lines of code. The uh, scikit build just wraps CMake, right, uh, wraps CMake right now by injecting itself here. It wrap, puts another wrapper on top of the wrapper that wraps distutils. And then it then you get uh, some of this stuff generated for you. Okay. And uh, CMake is, is a very popular choice. It's used in about 60% of all C++ uh, projects, very common in sciences. Um, it's really a, a nice thing for this, but this, this bridge has a lot of issues. So, um, this is the sort of new design idea where you'd have a scikit build core, or s the name may not be fixed in stone yet. Um, and then you could set up your project configuration, then you'd have a series of options passed to, to tool scikit build. And then this would uh, do the build and it would not touch, it wouldn't include setup tools at all. It would do, it, do the build entirely itself, just the way that these other mecha Python mechanisms work. Um, and this, uh, this package could then support the old scikit build sort of classic um, sort of plug-in mode. In fact, we're discussing the idea of setting this up as, as, a, um, as a PEP and then a, a library. Um, so this is a sort of a rough example of the idea where you could set up any build system, say Hatchling or, or something else, and then you could have some sort of like build system extensions and then your build system would simply know how to talk to the extension mechanism and that could build it. And it could be scikit build. You could have several. You could do mypyc. You could do mesun py or whatever, whatever other extension um, system you want. Um, and we just needed to find the interface for how this happens. And uh, there, there's already some initial work being done here. So this, this is an exciting uh, area. And uh, hopefully this will, this will move forward. Now, uh, as I said, I'm more, I'll be working on this. I put a uh, proposal to NSF to do this sort of over a three-year period. Sort of the first year is rewriting this, uh, sort of most of what I've described. Year two plan would be converting various projects to um, scikit-build, including uh, about nine or 10 that um, I, I uh, found beforehand and, and got uh, letters from, as well as, as others that are interested in, in joining. And then focusing on sort of building all the knowledge that we've gained over those years into a website, into tutorials into outreach and, and teaching people how to, how to build things using this. And uh, this, so the proposal also included a variety of other um, repositories that are related to this effort, things that I work on. Okay, and you can read more about the proposal. And uh, this actually was awarded on Wednesday, so two days ago. So I will be doing that over the next three years. So since last time, that the, Psych I've, we've been pushing scikit-build forward in the meantime. Um, Announcement on CMake, that's actually going to be probably dropping mini Linux one wheels. So as, as I said, those things are disappearing, going away, and CMake itself can't build on mini Linux one anymore. 23.23 specifically can't. So um, if you are for some reason using mini Linux one, and for some reason you can't stop using it, then uh, you'll need to pin your, your CMake. Um, so we've got ARM support, MSVC um, 2022 support, um, some long requested features like the target link libraries keyword, which should have been should have been there, but it's just because it's so old. Uh, as well as um, we also have um, some like um, few support for Windows, few other things. And we're also finally removing um, Python 2.7, 3.5 and MSCC 2015. So that's been removed uh, in the, the main branch. It's um, not released yet though. Okay. All right, so uh, with that, I'll leave it open for um, quest uh, questions. I and uh, we have our panel afterwards. So questions for all the, everything, and then also if you want to get in touch with these, because that's been a, a question that uh, has come up already. So um, you can we have GitHub discussions for each one of these three packages. Uh, we'll be working on maybe some other um, forms of communication, especially for scikit-build. 
but uh, that might be the easiest thing. Or of course, you can always um, contact me. I have, I'm available on, on GitHub and Twitter and, and places, and you can read about other things I'm doing on my blog on the top left. All right, thanks. Yes. Yeah, so, so right now it's using setup tools. So, um, because it was designed before like PEP 517 even existed, that was the only, only way to do things was basically just to hack setup tools and, um, sort of inject yourself. And so that was the way it was originally designed. The idea is to rewrite it so that it would not be using setup tools. It would be a pure build backend. It would use CMake, um, uh, and there would be no setup tools or just use tools involved, just like there's no setup tools involved in Hatchling or Flit or um, any of these others. So today, if I wanted to just get rid of setup entirely and put everything in the pocket, can I do it? Right, Not until this is rewritten. Right now, you still have to have a very minimal setup.py with any configuration option that setup that scikit build touches, um, which is a list of about six of them or so. Uh, as well as any configuration to psychic build itself. That should go away though in the next within the next year. The first panel and like another uh, question that everyone wants uh, to know is what is the future of packaging? Like you know, we have Conda, we have Conda Forge, we have Pipeline. How uh, what's uh, like what's the story there? <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, if I knew. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, I don't know. Um, I think within Python itself, you know, Pip and Conda are probably still going to be huge players. Conda has a role for the cross ecosystem thing, although I will say that, um, and Marius, you can back me up on this. I think we work best with the Python community by and large. Um, but I don't think like we have great insights into how we're going to fix packaging. Um, yeah, and I, I think uh, you'll still see both ecosystems sort of moving along, hopefully working together a little better as time goes on. The PIP ecosystem is going to be quite slow, PyPI, um, but they are interested in sort of working better. So there's a PEP that just went through recently that, um, uh, allows PIP to work a little better with system package managers to identify pack, uh, identify whenever there's packages that it just shouldn't touch, it shouldn't try to upgrade them because they're system. So it's, it does, it is moving forward and it's not, that's not gonna go away and Conda's not gonna go away. So um, and I think they sort of fill in slightly different roles and they do work together somewhat. And I hope it will improve. But they do fill different roles. There's certain packages I just could not ship on, on PyPI that only Conda can do, um, but PyPI is just works in so many different places and it works with everything rather than having a special Conda Python and Conda ship, shipping everything. Yeah. Uh, uh, the next question is a Conda Forge. Like, is the continuing growth sustainable? Like, are there any plans to cull unmaintained packages? So uh, we, 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 as part of this sort of like the large scale bot stuff, um, we do know which packages are unmaintained or under maintained. Um, right now, we don't really purge them. Um, but basically, um, they, for the most part, the under, -main pa under -main ta maintained packages get very few sort of downloads in any case. Mm -hmm. And so largely they're not particularly a, a, a big concern. Um, so frequently the, there, the, there is a quite a large amount of, uh, of feedstocks that, that have been um, sort of archived over the, over the years. And so we, that does happen like from, from time to time as, as things get removed or, or deprecated um, to, to some serious extent. And uh, feedstock owners do have the do have the ability to sort of like reach out to to Conda Forge to say it's like, hey, this thing is dead now. Um, 
please archive it and yeah. and and we'll do that and that that's been working well enough yeah. and uh like as Jared just joined us uh like can the scientific python coordination project and the packaging folks work together like is there any uh is there any is there anything that is required there I mean, I can say a few things, so. Yeah, so I haven't uh, actually done much uh, work on this yet, but I have been meaning. To, so one of the things we would like to do is have a bunch of um, uh, developer uh, topic focused summits. And I had on my mind trying to organize a packaging one with uh, you know, PIP people and Conda people and other things. So um, I definitely thought about this issue. And uh, then it's, you know, I guess also with CI build wheels and there's a whole bunch of little pieces that uh, I think would be worth. Uh, making sure we're thinking through correctly. I mean, yeah. I guess there's the, the packaging and then the tools to package as well. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Do you, do you have any thoughts on this or as a packaging? I'm sort of in, in both camps to a little bit. I really don't want to see them diverge any further. And um, you know, it can be very easy to think in terms of scientific Python and then the rest of Python. And I'd really like to work together as much as possible. And so scientific Python would be simply a, an addition to regular Python. And uh, especially in the packaging world, that, that, that's a little bit hard because we have requirements that the re a, you know, normal packaging community, they don't necessarily even think about at first. Uh, fine to build a tool, and if it doesn't happen to include compiled libraries at all, it seems fine there. But if for us, that's you know, most of what we do, a huge part of what we do. But I, I would like to see further further um, connection. They've been very open. I would say the, uh, the PyPA people are, are very open to, to trying to work with us, but we we'll have to realize they, they sort of move in a, a bit slower, um, maybe a bit slower pace than we would like. It's a little slower than say Honda might move forward. Yeah, so this is also a completely technically naive comment, uh, but in my mind, what I would love is that uh, as a, maintainer of a package uh, like network x i'd like to when i go ahead and make my packages you know when i run uh you know build s dist or whatever it would be amazing if it just made a a, a wheel anaconda thing and everything worked uh seamlessly so i don't know what the tooling would look like there for that but um yeah that's it would be nice if either they merged or like you generated the same thing from one thing um there's also another thing i would like to see is that uh i think there's some discrepancy between uh like so we have requirements uh, files, and they don't all. Uh, the syntax doesn't work exactly the same with pip and conda, and I think you know getting all the rough edges out with things like that would be good. Although I don't, maybe requirements is not even the thing we're going with in the future, but <laughs> yeah. So uh, one thing I will say, speaking um, more on the anaconda side than as a conda core maintainer, uh, is coordination of schedules is becoming increasingly important, especially as uh, you know, what we think of as production enterprise level Python. Um, and I think one of the challenges that we've certainly seen on the Anaconda and Conda Forge side is now you start having to worry about things that aren't Python. You have to worry about, well, how long is Windows 7 and 8.1 and 10 going to be supported? Like, what flavor of Linux are we actually going to target? Um, so, you know, we were talking about CI build wield and both Conda Forge and Anaconda default to CentOS 7. But if you start thinking about GUIs like Spider, for example, well, okay, let's build for CentOS 7, but now the newer versions of Fedora and Ubuntu have dropped Xorg, right? Yes. They're Wayland by default. Now we have to think about, okay, if I'm going to build a single package for this, um, can I safely assume I can use X11, yeah. right? And if I, do, if I say, well, do I want to build two packages? You know, do I want to build for three different glibcs? to say nothing of like muscle on Alpine. So I think from the packaging perspective, one of the bigger challenges is like we very quickly start drifting into things that aren't necessarily the Python community and things we as the Python community may not even be able to control. Yep. All right, uh, going on a tangent here, like type hints are a thing now and we have, we have a lot of maintainers here is like they, I mean, hopefully they should be a coherent story that detect 
do all packages adopt that and if they do it how they do it are they stubs are they in line is uh, like do we have any comments here of how other packages are doing it yeah, so this is one thing that uh, at Network X, uh, as a Network X maintainer, we've thought about is that you know there's been a lot of interest in uh, type hints, and then uh, the core developer team doesn't really you know use this. Uh, we don't use IDE, so like it's not so obvious to us the benefit, uh, and so we're not experts in it. And then you know someone who's not a core developer might come in and try to contribute some stuff, and then we don't know what you know whether we should accept or not accept. So we were kind of in this waiting pattern. Uh, and so one of the ideas that I've had was you know, in the scientific Python part of the project uh, is this seems like it'd be a really nice spec. Uh, if we could get, you know, there's probably a lot of people in our community that know quite a bit about type handling, but maybe not for each individual project. Um, so I think it would be nice if we could, uh, you know, that's a nice, I think, idea for a spec is that uh, people that know what the right thing to type hint are doing, uh, if that came in and became a spec and then some of the core projects endorsed it, I think the Network X team would think, oh, so okay, thank you. Uh, now we know the answer, how to do it. Um, I think there's been you know, discussions about inlining versus stubs. You know, we've been kind of thinking that inline doesn't uh, look as elegant. Um, and then we also use the NumPy doc string, which uh, sort of has some amount of information, but it's not validated in the same way the type hints are. Uh, and I also think it'd be nice to think about how to get NumPy doc and the type hint uh, machinery maybe working together a little bit better too. So I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done here, but I think a lot of the, at least in my experience, is a lot of the core developers of packages don't know uh, where the answer is. So I think it'd be nice for the people that do know about type hitting if you could come together and have more universal um, proposals for what we should do or best practices, it would be helpful. So some people I think knew about type hitting. I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of type hits. Um, the, uh, and I'm a big fan of putting them in line because they help you read your code. If you're looking at code you don't have never read before or code you're not very familiar with or code you just forgot because you read it six months ago, knowing what types are going through is a huge, huge benefit. And it does add more to somebody who is just entering the language. And it's really nice in Python that it is optional because that means if you're using NumPy, if you're just typing in a notebook, you're not gonna add type hints, you don't need to. Um, and you know, you can then use, you can still use a checker or an IDE and actually get a, assistance from those type hints. It, there is a, an extra sort of, it is a little bit more difficult to read the code that when you first see it because now there's more characters. But um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the inline type hints. Though, even though the, um, putting them in stubs also has lots of really nice benefits, um, like being able to just download the stub package and do the check without having to download the entire package and worrying about whether NumPy is actually available for your system or not. Things like that, um, but I think it's it's hard. It'll be interesting to see what uh, would come up as a community because I feel like a lot of people sort of have to approach this because it's a new thing. It's not a required thing, and so some in maintainers will come across it. They'll just they don't like the look. They they think oh this this makes my code more ugly, and then eventually they will read something and realize suddenly realize hey that type in helped me understand what what that was. This function took a uh, time, you know, a variable called time and it was a string. So now I know they were passing in this this thing. Um, and then they'll start slowly adding them. Eventually you start seeing, if you start using MyPy, then you'll start seeing an effect and so you start finding some bugs in code. You can almost always, if you go through and fully statically type a code base, you'll almost always find some things that are likely causing problems somewhere. Um, I would say any non-trivial code base you will um, because there are, mis are mistakes. You'll always find some you know, and people, you should, the type hints were important because if you look at the NumPy docs, it's literally part of the docs. For writing documentation to people, they put types in. But those types are often wrong because they're not checked by anything. So it's really just documentation that's checked. But um, it is a bit different for different packages and it's very different for maintainers and it's not something you're absolutely required to do. And it's nice that you're not required to do it. But yeah, I think I think having some some guideline would help, but it's it's, I think it might be a little bit personal too. So I think something that would probably help quite a bit, particularly in the sort of for, for type ins, particularly in the sort of scientific sort of Python space, is to get is to get tools like like Cython and PyBind eleven to to make it to make some of that stuff easier, so that you know because PyBind eleven you know splits out shared, you know a shared object and your IDE has no idea what the types for a lot of that stuff is, and so if, if a tool like PyBind eleven could also additionally emit you know a type stub that that you ship alongside that thing, then a lot of these things start playing playing together 
so much more nicely and much more smoothly. Like it actually does. Uh, so it produces. So it doesn't produce a type stub. It produces the SO file. But then um, MyPy has a tool. MyPy C that can pull out. I think it's uh, stubgen. That can you give it that SO file and then it spits out the type stub for you. Um, we do, because we were doing that before um, MyPy existed. Some of some of it isn't formatted correctly for MyPy though. MyPy actually the runs PyPy eleven in their their test suite now. I believe. Right from the other one. Um, well, once you have the type stub, it works. The same thing. Okay. So they have the tool for it. Um, it's not quite ideal. And uh, so ideally, we would update our type hints to handle the, the changes in, in NumPy, because again, it, that didn't exist back when PyBind 11 was there. So we didn't have the right um, signature. Um, and the stubgen actually converts a few of those, I think, for us, just because it's trying to produce the right thing. Like so that there's there's some some things that can be done there, but it does it does exist. It's close enough where you can generate the type stub and then just manually clean it up. All right, uh, I would like to open up to the audience, and if you have any questions for the panel, please please go ahead. Yep. I think just yell should be fine. <laughs> Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, for the recording, it's better. Oh, yeah. um, I have a question about the usefulness of type hinting in numeric Python. I find that often, like having my type hints be function A's and ND array, uh, argument A, ND array, ND array returns ND array, isn't that helpful? I would like to be able to say, I have a 2D array of integers, a 1D array of floats, and I'm expecting like a 3D array back. Do you um, think this is going to be something that we can make possible and even type check? I mean, there's a pep that landed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, the pep that kind of does that. It yeah. needed a pep. Yeah, it, it needed a pep, and that pep is now is now in. Um, and so as of, I think, Python 3.11, Python 3 .11, there's, a, there's a mechanism that'll, that, al that enables that. Now, I don't think anything's using that yet, but you know, I think that's definitely one of those things where it's like that is a spec that we need to write <laughs> as a, as a community because you know it's like NumPy and and all array like things as and as well as things like, as well as data frame like things you know it's like they should kind of do that right. I can't remember the number of the pep, but you know it's like something it's like. Six four six. We have another question. Six four six. Hey Riddle, you just want to say the mic six four six was the name of the pep? The name of the pep was six four six. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was just kind of wondering. Um, uh, you know, recently uh, Apple, for example, unveiled this M1 chip, and uh, my team's experience was that oh, we actually had a, a little bit of trouble uh, with builds for a while. And as that kind of thing happens, you know, the grid of, of versions and hardware architectures and everything starts to grow. Uh, it becomes more of a resource uh, drain on some level to provide coverage. And I'm wondering if you all have thoughts about uh, acquiring resources or, you know, partnering with the hardware manufacturers or public clouds or anything like that in order to kind of keep up with it's sort of a growing and growing ecosystem, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, in an ideal world, yes, right. Like in an ideal world, Apple would have provided M1 for a lot of the scientific Python community before it fully launched. But the reality is, it's, you know, it's hard to get the resources. Um, I know. We were talking about on Python 11 supporting Windows on ARM, or sorry, CI, yeah. Windows on ARM with CI build wield. We're starting that similar conversation on the Conda side, but um, you know, to their credit, Microsoft is starting to engage with our community on it. Um, but the last I heard from them, the, the issue they have is they don't have the hardware themselves, right? So we're slowly, uh, you know, cross compilation gets you some of the way there, but it obviously has, you know, you have to pull tricks, and then how do you test it? Um, I know Condaforge, we do a lot of cross-compilation, and you add, 
yeah, and emulation, and you still end up with like, how do you test it? Um, and interestingly, you know, going back to my earlier comment, with with the hardware, especially, uh, you know, ARM is an interesting thing for us to start thinking about uh, because ARM V8 covers a diverse, diverse range of hardware, right? And so. For example, on Condaforge rebuild against basically the baseline ARM V8 implementation, um, which will run on everything from you know Raspberry Pi to, to AWS's Graviton. Um, but then again, as you, you start thinking about uh, what I'm gonna call production use, now you have these interesting questions where, yeah, you know, portability for a lot of us package maintainers is it takes priority over everything else, right? As a user, you know, if you're deploying on the, the SBSA, so server grade ARM, are you willing to live with that potential drop in performance, right? And if you're not, who do you go engage with to, what do you do? Do you build special wheels? Do you build special Conda packages? Um, and then on the, it comes back to the maintainers of, well, if we build these special, you know, different builds, like how do we distinguish between them? Um, yeah, and I think, you know, it would be great if we could find CI resources anywhere, uh, but the reality of it is like, it just costs everybody money, right? Um, you know, I think with, with Condaforge, as Marius and Wolf were explaining, like, you know, we've moved everything pretty much to Azure, except for a few stray things, but there's there's an overhead we have to pay. Um, and I, I, I don't know if we have any great solutions for it, um, other than maybe asking companies to donate more to NumFocus so we can go buy CI time. All right, so uh, we have a question for NumPy. Like, how would the like like how would the uh, the new work on UFunk and like you know uh, implementing D types in, uh, integrate with pandas and pandas D types? Yeah, so. The pandas d-types, they have an extension mechanism which is quite different. It, it works on a slightly different level compared to the NumPy one. Um, my hope is that we can integrate the two and I'm not sure how exactly that should look like, whether uh, we would make an extension array, what pandas calls it, that supports the NumPy d-type, so you would have like an intermediate thing, or whether we can teach pandas to just work with um, NumPy d-types directly, which I think should be possible. Um, I did not look into this end much yet, so I don't know exactly how um, difficult it would be. I think I don't think there's any um, serious issue why pandas shouldn't just be able to use the new NumPy types. It uses NumPy types already. It's just a few more now, basically. But there will be issues and there will be things that need to be fixed up and, and, and consolidated. Right. Uh, do we have any more questions? Uh, Okay, so many of our domain libraries like to take an input called an array-like. How do you feel about deprecating the term array-like? So that, so when I'm thinking about it's a list of lists or a list of lists of lists of lists, like deprecating the term array-like so that everyone just takes arrays <laughs> and not array-likes anymore. In NumPy, I guess. NumPy created the term array-like, I think. 